OK, so uh, again, thank you for joining us for the searching for references and stress free bibliographies. Uh, we started off with a question of uh, what you struggle with uh, when you are basically conducting a search, and we've had some really interesting uh, quest, uh, answers. So thinking about then what are some of the things that is, is cause search anxiety? And it says we mentioned some, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the options uh, if you conduct a search and you get back a thousand, two thousand results. Um, also, this, it can be overwhelming, of course. At which platform do you use? What type of database do you use? So if, while modern technology has given us an overwhelming array of options, sometimes all those options can be overwhelming. Um, also, knowing where to start, uh, that can be difficult. Um, basically, do you start with Google? Uh, do you start by going into your library catalog? Uh, most of the common things is like, let's start Googling it. Um, and so that can be a difficult thing. Uh, is Google the right place to start searching? Uh, so it raises all these type of questions. Feeling unsure what your options are, uh, what options are available to you. Uh, and so uh, some of you uh, recently, if you've gone through the finding e-resources, you we've talked about some of the databases. Uh, we'll look at basically databases a little bit today as well. Um, we'll work with Scopus. <clears throat> also feeling unsure how to conduct a search. So one of the things that we're going to talk about today is basically uh, how to conduct a search strategy and keep a record of your searches. That way you're not going over and doing the same amount of work uh, again. Uh, and I guess at the end, all of this is just to say that it's OK <clears throat> to feel all these things uh, initially. Uh, we're not born knowing this. Uh, it's learned and this is what we're going to cover today. So if you have these anxieties at this moment, uh, that's completely fine. It's completely normal. And this is just the first step to trying to get you to feel a little bit more comfortable uh, creating uh, search strategies. So. Um, some of the objectives for today's uh, workshop. We're going to create a search strategy on a topic in order to perform a search on iDiscover catalog and at least one database. Uh, we're going to discover the referencing style for your subject, and this is looking more forward towards the second half of the workshop where we'll, we'll talk about uh, Zotero and bibliographies. We're going to have a little bit of practice on importing resources into Zotero so you can start creating your own reference library. And then you'll create a bibliography using Sotero, uh, either with through the clipboard fun function or the write and cite uh, feature on that there. So um, developing the search strategy. Um, the search strategy is a plan of how you're going to take your search and what search terms you'll be using and how to combine them in order to find the most relevant information on your topic. So dedicating time at this very early stage when you get a topic uh, can be really important because it can help you find your results more quickly and it makes it easier for you to refine uh, those results uh, and so that they're more fit to purpose. So, so when you're thinking about basically developing a search strategy, uh, there's usually two stages to 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 it you want to first identify the terms the search terms that you're you're going to be thinking about in your research questions or the writing prompt uh, to conduct to conduct a search and the second stage would be uh, combining your search terms in order to get the best results for your search so thinking more first uh, in terms of identifying your search terms. Uh, when you receive your writing prompt or you've decided on your research topic, one of the things that you'll want to do first is to break it down into terms that will give you the best results for your results. So you do this by identifying key terms in your questions. So for example, if we were to look at this question here, um, how much does deforestation contribute to the fires in the Amazon? Uh, what are some of the key terms that might pop out uh, for us here? And if you like, you can put some in the chat. Yes, deforestation, really good, yeah. Amazon. Deforestation, very good, Amazon, yes. <clears throat> very good, yes, fire. Fires in the Amazon, yeah, climate change. Oh, very good. Fires in the Amazon, yes, yes. And so um, you can see that we were going to draw out and try to put this into a search engine, uh, these would be some of the big uh, key terms here um, that you would want to to take a look at here. So at this point, 
in the the pre the workshop, I'd like you to have a little bit of a think. We're going to take about two two to three minutes here. Uh, think about a question that you'd like to work on at this moment and try to write it down in the form of a question. Um, so this could be your research topic that you're thinking about working on. Uh, if you're an MPhil, uh, if you're an undergraduate, it, maybe you've gotten a supervision question and you're trying to find resources, uh, PhD as well. If you're a big research question, think about your research question and write write it down for yourself here in about. We'll give about two minutes for this exercise. And I will turn off my camera here. That way, I'm not staring at you. OK, we're going to take about maybe another minute at most. Alrighty, go ahead and hopefully you have a question uh, that you've got for yourself. So right now we're just going to hold on to that. Uh, we'll be using that question a little bit later uh, in the workshop here. So now that you've got your question, um, basically there's a couple of other things that you want to do, I uh, think about for the next step. So we want to think about some alternative terms or phrases that you could use for your search. And this is really because a lot many authors, they tend to use different terms to refer to the topic that you're searching for. So thinking about alternative terms or synonyms for your search terms can help you get a more well-rounded search result. So here on the slide, you can see I've given you some suggestions of, of where it might be helpful to kind of generate alternative terms. So you can use technical language, you can use different spellings or abbreviations. If you need help thinking about alternative terms, you can also look at an online encyclopedia or thesaurus. Um, Google Scholar uh, is a good place as well because there is a function where you can find related searches and that might help you in terms of chain searching to look for other uh, articles that might have uh, related uh, material. Um, also using keywords that you'll find on academic databases such as Scopus. So we'll have a little bit look uh, here in a little bit about Scopus and I'll show you where the author has provided their own keywords to an article and you can see basically whether that matches or if there's something that you can pick up from the author keywords as well. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind uh, to think about alternative search terms. There is also basically moving to the second stage of creating a good search strategy uh, is thinking about ways to combine these terms. And so we have something called Boolean operators. Um, now, really what they are is because they're 
there are these keywords such as and or not, and they allow you to expand or narrow your search depending on the operator that you're using. So for example, here, the operator or allows you to combine alternative terms with the same type of concept uh, by typing or in capital letters between them. Uh, this will also search for results that contain any of these alternative terms. So here it's peanut butter or jelly. Um, this is a good way to also widen your search uh, in terms of what you'll get back. The and combines different terms uh, and concepts, so this will give you a much more specific uh, and it will generally reduce the number of results that you get in your search, but it will increase the relevance of the results. So um, apologies for the peanut butter and jelly um, reference. I know this might not be something very common in the UK, but from the US, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, you can see the American influence on this, sorry. So uh, combining your search terms uh, in using Boolean operators. Uh, here's a little bit more of a practical example, and we're going back to our question, how much does deforestation contribute to fires in the Amazon? So starting with the term deforestation, uh, you can see how I drew up a couple of alternative terms such as logging, forest degradation, or clear cutting. And now if I were to conduct a search in the database, I could combine a couple of these terms with the examples by using this type of Boolean operator, or and remembering that this will give me results that contain similar, basically, concepts uh, to deforestation logging. Um, but if I wanted to make a little bit more focus, then I could add and, so and fire and Amazon. Um, and so this is what a type of on the right hand side of the slide, uh, what a search might look like if I were putting it in a database. So deforestation or logging or clear cutting and fire and Amazon. So let me do a little bit of a demo uh, on on Scopus here. So I'll stop sharing. Now I want to share my share my screen. So this is uh, getting back a little bit to I discover um, you. If you want to start for databases, you could remember that we have the databases up here. I click on that. Just move my screen there. Here on the right hand side, I'm just waiting for databases to load up. We have the most popular databases. I'll go to Scopus. And so, um, yes. AI, which we'll talk about later. I found that this out about this uh, last night when I was preparing for this, and I just got completely excited. Ended up saying to about 11:30, playing around with Scopus AI. But uh, let's get back. So we're doing a search. Where we're going to go deforestation. So with Scopus, um, if you remember, I said you could use Boolean operators. You could do the search string out like this here. But the nice thing about Scopus is that if you add a field, it already has the Boolean operators uh, integrated here on the search. So here I just want to do a very simple search and fires and Amazon. Let me turn off my theme library. Get So here are some things that you'll see here. Um, that search gave us back 471 documents. Um, if we wanted to, we could have a quick look at some of them, but you can see some of the, the relevance. Fires may prevent future Amazon forest recovery after large scale deforestation. So it's got some of the keywords in here, forest degradation, um, assessment of climate, environmental and social economic aspects of the Brazilian Cerrado. You've got Brazilian Amazon indigenous territories under deforestation pre pressure. So let's, if we were just to look here. So you have the abstract. Here, remember when I was talking about looking for alternative terms, you have the indexed keywords. So we have forest fire, if we wanted to put that. We've got deforestation. Um, we can see, does the author provide any keywords? Not on this result. 
But the nice thing is then it shows the references where you can get, kind of then go off and look to see if there's any other similar. So this would be searching backwards where you're looking at the bibliography or the references of an article uh, and see what they've cited. So if it's a particular helpful article, this is a great place to look to see um, basically who the scholar may have used as well. You can see in, in Scopus that it's cited by zero documents, so it hasn't been cited yet. Um, this could be a good thing or bad thing, uh, depending, but let's go back to our results. And on the left hand side, you can see that um, Scopus allows you to break it down by subject areas. So if you were trying to narrow it down to maybe something that's very subject specific, you could click here and it would uh, narrow it down to a, let's go with our environmental sciences, limit two. That brings it down to 229. Um, we can set the date range as well. Maybe you don't want something. So let's see, maybe from here, 2012 to 2023. We could English or Portuguese, and this is a nice option um, because if looking at scholars in the Global South, this might be important, especially if you're trying to widen your scholarship uh, to include other voices. Uh, this could be really good. You could break it down by article, review chapter. So let's look at that. Um, affiliation, if this is important for you, you can also narrow it down that way. Funding sponsor, uh, for some fields this is an important uh, thing to see. Also when you're critically assessing a source to see if there's any type of intention in terms of, of any possible um, basic conflict of interest that might occur. Uh, that might be. So let's go ahead and limit it to that. We've got down to 203 um, with that. So this is these are some ways that you can kind of um, limit the results. Now, if we wanted to do another search, let's go ahead and So again, this is what we're doing. We're doing the OR. So hopefully this will bring back the forestation or logging. Um, this will hopefully widen our search results from the original 400. So let's see. Ah, yes, because we've limited to. Yeah, so you see how that gives us a bit of a wider uh, search result back from our original 400, I think it was 417. So now we've got 100 extra more, um, 100 extra more documents to find. Another nice feature about Scopus is that if you click Analyze Results, it does pretty much the same thing as the information on the left hand side uh, by narrowing it that way. So, but it gives you a little bit more off the off the bat, the numbers of 2003, 2022, 2021, uh, documents by years. So it gives you the information a lot more, uh, for me, clearly. Uh, if you're a visual person like me, um, you can click on here, documents by subject. It breaks it down into a pie chart. So it's another way to kind of look at it really, really quickly. You can change the years to get And see how the pie chart changes as well. So that is um, Scopus for that. Other great thing, you can also export your data as well. So let's say you just wanted to come back and you liked the set, you want to maybe have a, a record of it, you can export it based to um, CSV or Excel. You can change it to an Excel. You can do that into Mendeley um, at, or Zotero as an RRS. So there's a bit of integration there that allows you. So uh, for databases like these, usually Web of Science and Scopus, um, they have these type of things that, that can be really helpful. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here.
So we've talked a little bit about Boolean operators. We've talked about basically alternative terms. We've talked also about um, how to look on some of the databases. So they can be really helpful, but here are a couple of other search tips that might be be helpful in, in terms of your searching. You can use quotation marks in a phrase search, and this will help you only bring back the results where basically, in this case, clear cutting that I've used, um, the results would come back with clear cutting together. Uh, in some cases, if you do a quick search, you'll get research results that bring back clear, cutting and they're not necessarily what you're looking for. So by doing these type of quotation marks, you're trying to ins you ensure that basically the search results will bring back that set of words that you're looking for. There's also proximity searching as well. So if it's important uh, to kind of maybe the words aren't together in a certain sense, if you put this W forward stroke three, um, so here's sustainable W forward stroke three tourism, it will bring back results where basically those two words appear within three words of each other. Uh, so it's another way to kind of get a little bit more wider uh, sense if it doesn't bring back. And then there's also truncation, uh, which is perhaps one of my favorite, uh, where you use an asterisk, uh, an asterisk at the end of the word and at the end of the root. So basically it will bring back, it will look for all the type of variations that are possible. So in this case, deforest, Asterix uh, brings back deforesting, deforestation. So uh, it's another cool way, I think, to kind of get um, a wider sense of results than what you're looking for. So how do you keep track of all these results? So you can see if we did a search, we've got back 417, 521. Uh, so some of the things uh, that we recommend is to keep a search grid. And a search grid is a great way to kind of keep track of the results that you've gotten back, the type of search terms that you've used to get those results. So this is a sample search grid that you can download from our Wolfson College LibGuide. I will drop in the link here in a little bit in the chat. Um, but pretty much you would put the question at the very top, you use the key search terms uh, that keywords that you're using in your your search. So you can see I've had search trip one and so going downwards and or going horizontally. So it looks a little bit like this when we put it in more practical terms to the question, how much does deforestation contribute to fires? So you can see kind of like what I've done in the Scopus search, it goes downwards. Uh, the only difference is that it goes horizontally uh, with the ors, but as you can see with Scopus, you can just follow that line or that thread uh, itself there. Any questions so far? Oh, we're, okay, I see a thumbs up. So, <laughs> all right, so we're good to go then. Uh, so some more key tips then. So as you start basically searching for resources, um, one of the things that is important is to remember that the process is iterative. Uh, you'll have it means that you have to do it over again. It's something that you go doing and refining your approach uh, as you go doing it. Uh, you get a little bit more practice. It here are some also helpful tips to help you. So we talked about limiting the scope for your specific search and limiting it through, for example, year, subjects, funders, language, types of resources that you might be looking for. Uh, also, maybe you might need to clarify your research questions. So um, that could be something if you're getting results that are completely different from what you're hoping to get. Um, it said this is a process of kind of refining the research question. Uh, maybe there's a way to kind of narrow it down a little bit. Uh, it makes you become more reflective, um, uh, reflective about the type of, of, of question that you're asking. And also you want to consider the output format and management strategy. How are you going to manage that? Uh, basically your your resources and your search results and basically the type of sources that you're getting uh, from this here. Uh, I have a question, I think, in the chat. Uh, what is quotation marks in the tips? Ah, yeah, so the quotation marks were for basically phrase searching. So when you put in, um, for example, a certain set of words like clear cutting inside the quotation marks, when you do put that into a database or, or a catalog, it will bring back the results with those two words together, so like clear cutting together, rather than results that have clear or cutting uh, or sometimes clear cutting together. But uh, this is a way to kind of make sure that you keep those two words together. Um, hopefully does that does that answer your question. Okay, 
So we saw AI um, basically in Scopus, and I think this is probably a question that um, we could probably talk about in terms of AI. There's no way to avoid it. Um, we all probably have known about ChatGPT, and there's a, just an array of of other AI co-pilots and, and assistants that are out there. So one of the things that we kind of say is always use caution with it. Um, there are some problems with AI, uh, especially if you're relying for it on resources and things like that. But some things that it can do well is it can help with alternative terms, for example. Um, if you can put in a Boolean search and say, can you provide some alternative terms for that? Um, it can be really quite helpful with that, actually. So there's this framework that we've recently thought about, and 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 it comes from another scholar that's been working on this, and it's called the Clear Framework, uh, and it stands for the acronym of Concise, Logical, Explicit, Adaptive, and Reflective. So basically, it all goes back to this idea of prompt engineering. How do you put in basically a prompt for the language model to actually interpret, and then provides relevant examples for you. So if we start with concise, basically you want to remove all the type of extra information uh, and allow the AI language model to focus on important aspects of the task. And this will help to result in more relevant responses. So we can see example here, uh, use concise and explicit prompts such as explain the process of photosynthesis and its significance instead of, can you provide me with a detailed explanation of the process of photosynthesis and its significance? So you can see the, the type of, of taking away the extra language and really getting down to the core of what you want it to do. Um, also, another thing, instead of requesting, please provide me with an extensive discussion of the factors that contributed to the economic growth of China during the last few decades, use a concise prompt, like identify factors behind China's recent economic growth. Um, it's also, I think, when you think about it, about your own writing, when you're trying to make your own writing more concise and, and a little bit more tighter, it follows on the same type of principle here. Uh, logical uh, then emphasizes the significance of sustaining the logical flow or order of ideas within a prompt. So a logically structured prompt enables the model to better comprehend the context and the relationships between various concepts, resulting in hopefully more accurate and coherent outputs. So I've given you an example here. Uh, list of steps to write a research paper, beginning with selecting a topic and ending with proofreading the final draft. And you see how it's going step by step uh, of what it's asking the, the AI uh, assistant to do. Uh, it could also be describe the steps in the scientific method, starting with forming a hypothesis and ending with drawing conclusions. So you've kind of set the limits uh, of what are the scope of what you're trying to ask the AI to do. Also making it explicit uh, prompts. So uh, basically these will help in in getting the output format or scope, uh, hopefully reducing the likelihood of unanticipated irrelevant responses from the AI model. So here's another example. Uh, instead of tell me about the French Revolution, an explicit prompt would be provide a concise overview of the French Revolution, emphasizing causes, major, major events and consequences. So you're prompting it, you're helping it to kind of giving giving it a sense of what it should be trying to return to you. Um, also adaptive. So basically this is to kind of help emphasize the adaptability of the prompt, uh, prompt engineering. So experimenting with various prompts, formulations, phrases and temperature settings in order to kind of establish a balance between this type of creativity and concentration that you're asking it to do. Um, so for example, tell me about the French Revolution, be a bit more explicit, uh, provide a concise, oh wait, did I, oh, I must have, uh, ever you have major consequences, uh, rather than what are some of the renewable energy resources, opt for a more explicit version, like identify five renewable energy resources. Um, I may have actually kind of put the wrong information on this slide, so I will go back and, and um, put some right information here. But the last one being reflective, and I think this is what, what is important. Um, when you get back the results, you can't just stop there. You can't uh, take it as basically completely accurate information. It's incumbent upon you to actually critically evaluate uh, the responses that you get. And this can be pretty helpful. Uh, you want to basically 
look at the accuracy of the information, the relevance, the completeness. So you're not doing away with these fundamental skills that are important to the research process and important to you in being critical researchers of the information. And I think that's the, probably one of the big uh, things uh, we want to emphasize that uh, is to remain critical and practice these skills that have made you uh, a researcher and have gotten you here to the university. Uh, so with that in mind, before we have a little bit of practice, I wanted to show you um, Scopus of what they've done with their A AI, because everybody focuses on ChatGPT, but um, some of the, the, the major sources are kind of trying to incorporate AI in their models as well. So I've shown you basically, we go to Scopus AI, and we type in our questions. Um, oh, sorry. Let me just get back to my question. So, what would you like to learn more about? Maybe later. So you can see that one of the things that Scopus has done is it's giving overbased, uh, basically summaries, um, overviews of some of the research. It's important that they say that it is since 2018. So this is is really interesting. Um, you can show the references from this over overview of summary. And the nice thing is that it is incorporated with things from Scopus. So hopefully that lends a little bit more towards the validity of the answer. Uh, but again, you still would want to go back and check this information that, that comes in there. Um, you can see the abstract to the articles that it has. Uh, this is from Scopus as well. Um, you could then go off to the article. Uh, so if we were to open a new tab, forest degradation in Southwest Brazilian impact of tree species on economic interest and traditional use. Um, you can see here going again back to the author keywords. So here we have forest fire, non-timber trees, timber trees. So as I said, as you're exploring your research topic, uh, you want to keep a uh, maybe a collection of these type of alternative terms. That way you can use and you can go back and search for yourself. Um, the interesting thing also is that it will vis help you visualize some of the key terms that are in this summary up here. So you can see some of the key terms uh, that it has uh, it's brought out from the summary and from the articles that it has used. Um, another nice thing about it is that it also gives you different forms of asking the questions with a bit of a different overview as well. So we get some of the uses here. I think that we've gotten a little bit more. So this is another, I guess, a, another approach to kind of approaching your, your search that uh, you should be aware of. But again, um, it is pretty much, it is incumbent upon you to, to kind of be checking your sources and not relying completely. And I think that's the, uh, the key thing. You want to basically use it as an assistant uh, for you. Uh, don't let it do your thinking, replace your thinking, um, if that could, if that makes sense. Now we've come to the part where um, you have a little bit of practice as well. So remember that uh, research question, question I had you ask. So think about some, now practice you thinking about some alternative terms, um, basically check the words, keywords for articles that might match what you're looking for. We want to go back and look at basically either in the database or I discover and try to find some sources that might be relevant to that search that you're using. Uh, remember, you can use phrase searching, truncation, uh, some of the search tips that we have. Um, and let's take about 15 minutes at most uh, to kind of have, have a little bit of practice on this. And if you have any questions, I will Turn off my camera here, uh, but I will be here so you can type them up and I can type and that way I won't be, uh, we won't be interrupting 
the other participants that are that are doing this. So about about 15 minutes at most, and then we'll take have a little bit of break and then we'll come back for the uh, Zotero part. So 15 minutes. Uh, are we all clear? Uh, where can we find the Scopus AI? Alex, um, yes, uh, sorry. Uh, goes through my cam email. OK, so the Scopus AI was uh, found. Let me stop sharing. From the main page of basically the search, uh, it was found here up on the top, uh, Scopus Beta. Um, for the AI, I got to Scopus using from iDiscover. So over here, and I went to that database. Once that loads, it should be under popular databases. And if you click here, it should go there. Um, Can we see a copy of your slides for examples of how you conducted your searches? Uh, yes, so that that search grid um, would that be is that the the one that you're looking for? Okay, wonderful. I'll just show a little bit of the analyzing uh, the results and then I will pop that up for the on the search grid. So. If we go to we get to the search right here, um, right here on this line, it should say analyze results. And if you click on that, you get this type of page here that allows you to to do that. So you can still do the same function on this left hand side. Just kind of playing around through with this here, but this is a bit more visual and I tend to kind of like it a little bit better um, just because it lets me see information more quickly than and it's got everything opened up so you can scroll down. And then let me get to my slides now. All right, so I will turn off my camera right now.
Okay, so we've taken about two more minutes, two more minutes to. To kind of do some of this initial searching, um, answering the question, did I get an invite to become a tester? No, um, I didn't, which I thought that's why it was released to the general public. All right, so I think if we just kind of bring our searching to a close, um, hopefully you were able to kind of get some some sense of of some of the the searching uh, using some databases. So we're just going to do a very quick recap of some of the things that we've talked about. Um, again, I would just want to reiterate: it's okay to feel a bit anxious about the searching process. It's not something that's quite natural, uh, but Hopefully you've picked up some tips uh, for this. Um, the importance of developing a search strategy in terms of identifying key terms, 
from either your research question or the questions that you've been given to write on and basically how to combine these search terms in a catalog or database. Uh, keeping track of your search and results can be really important. That way you're not replicating work uh, and basically taking a valuable research time uh, away from work that you've already done. And don't forget some of the key tips of basically phrase searching, truncation, and other tips that we've covered today. So um, I think now would probably be a good to take a maybe five to ten minute break. Ten minute break. Uh, let's ha have some coffee, get up, stretch our legs a little bit, and we'll come back for Zotero uh, to give you a very quick overview of Zotero. Okay, I'll be here uh, during the break. If you have any questions, um, we can we can talk. Uh, during the 10 minutes. So we'll come back at about, let's say 11, let's say 11.05, that way you get a nice round number. 11.05, please.
All right, uh, so we're back for managing your references. Um, so we've started with the first stage and, and we kind of think about research in the various stages. So you you defined your research question, you're thinking about your question, you've thought about key terms, you've done a bit of searching, hopefully. Um, and then now we're thinking about how do you manage all this information that you're getting? Uh, so what we're trying to do in these early stages is think about workflows, uh, and this can be really important. So you're basically trying to, to maximize your workflow so that you're not basically replicating work and you're working more efficiently for yourself. And this helps to bring a little bit of the stress and anxiety down about the research process. So um, I guess we could maybe do a show of hands or maybe you can put in the chat, but how many of you use already a a re reference management software or are you kind of new uh, to this? You can raise your hand or you can or you can put in the chat. That's completely fine. Use Mendeley. OK, yes, Otero. Great. Otero desktop. Yes. New Alex. OK, thank you. New. OK, good. All right. Slightly familiar with Mendeley. OK. Wonderful. Zotero, Tobias, yes, thank you so much. Yes, Mendeley, okay, great. So Mendeley is is good as well. Um, typically you have access to, was it EndNote uh, through the University of Cambridge. I've heard this is a really good reference management software. The only, uh, I guess, drawback about that is that when you leave the university, if you want to continue using it, you have to have to pay for it. You have to pay for it. Uh, so we in the library community usually tend to push Zotero or Mendeley. They both are kind of work on the same same process. Zotero is open source uh, and it, it's free. I think Mendeley is, is as well. Um, I chose Mendeley just because it was the first one that I ran into uh, when I was thinking about managing resources and it's just much more intuitive for me uh, as a user. But before that, um, I was the type of person that, as I said, um, didn't use a reference manager. Uh, every time I was writing something, I was surrounded by a book pile of books and articles, and I end up finding out that I really didn't like doing bibliographies because it just took so much time. Uh, and so basically, once I discovered Mendeley, I thought, I, sorry, Zotero, I thought, wow, this is amazing because I'll show you a little bit of what it can do really quickly since. So let me just sh stop sharing. and share my screen. So hopefully you've had an opportunity to download Zotero. Um, you can see that we have it here. I, I can drop the link back in. I sent it to you in an email yesterday, uh, but I will drop the link uh, back in in the chat as, as soon as it. But what Zotero does is it is a complete reference manager um that allows you to keep all your sources so here you get a very quick sense of how it looks like you can see on the left hand side uh i you can make folders for projects that uh you're working on um this is i'm on my general library so this library will contain all the resources that you've downloaded in pretty much all these little sub projects that that you can be working on or you can just keep it keep it work from here directly um, you can see that it has icons that change so you have this for example is an article uh, this is a a chapter here in, from an encyclopedia entry um, this is a book chapter uh, this is a book as well so the nice thing is it, in visual sense it gives you a sense of what you have in here um, you can might have already seen here on the on the right hand side. You can bring in um, PDFs to it so that you can also work with with PDFs. So you can store the P PDF that you download. So as you're doing your searching and if you start downloading PDFs or chapters, this is a great way to hold hold on to it. Uh, if we were to click on one of it, one of our sources here, you'll see that. It has pretty much all the metadata that you need, uh, all the information that you need uh, to make a resource. And this is what tells you about basically the source. So I've got a book, book section, tells me what type it is. Uh, I've got the title, the authors, basically the book title, publisher date and information. So the important thing is to show is in a certain sense, 
you can make a bibliography once you have all this information in really quickly. So I were just to make a bibliography like this, control. What I'm doing is I'm pressing control, selecting the articles. I want to create a bibliography from items. What you do get up uh, that pops up is is asking you for your reference style. So I'm going to go with the APA. I've copied it to clipboard. And you can press OK. And then I wanted to. Control V. And what it does then is it spits out a bibliography very, very quickly uh, if you've entered the, you know, all the information in there. And so when I first came up to this, I thought, wow, this is really quite amazing because all of a sudden now I have basically all my information uh, really quickly here. I will just do delete that. So what the things that I'm going to show you uh, is we're going to walk through basically how do you then kind of start building a library? Uh, how do you get some sources into your library, putting in citations, um, how to create a folder, uh, and basically uh, then how to do some of this copy and paste. And there's another feature called Write and Cite uh, with Zotero, uh, which basically it installs a plugin on your Word and you can just access your Zotero library that way. So we'll start for the first things, uh, entering a, a citation in there. So I'm going to stay on this folder here, but we could create another folder. So we can click here. If you've downloaded and you've had your Zotero open, uh, you can click on new collection and we can go Zotero. That's what I'm going to name it. And I've got a blank page here. So if I want to then go to I discover. So I have already done a search on Dracula and imperialism. Um, it's the October season, why not? Uh, so Dracula and imperialism, I've limited to articles and resources. Um, so there are a couple of things you can do uh, with Zotero. So if you've downloaded it, you can see that hopefully you've got the plugin. Uh, what it does with is adapts to the browser. It creates a plugin that you can download and you can get articles in a couple of different ways this way. So if we were to, let's say, go to that, we could go to the full text available. So using the plugin was you could basically. So one thing was a terror you want to be positioned on where you want the source to go. So here I'm on the folder Zotero 2 practice. So we close that. We can then click the plugin and this will tell you where it's going. So OK, unfortunately, this is a web page. It hasn't given me as a journal. So. What you'll see is, oh, actually. Has given me as a journal. Um, but you can see the information is not quite right, so it's brought across all this this bad information. So the nice thing about the terrorists, you can always edit your information in this way. So you can edit it that way with a vengeance. So you'll get the sense of what I'm I'm going to I'm doing here. Um, I won't spend too much more time on this reference because I want to show you basically how it downloads the. But you can see it has. I haven't saved that. 
Let's move on to a different reference. There we go. Now we've got it onto. So the same thing with Zotero. There we go, it's bringing across this. And if we're lucky now this time. Yes, so now it's brought across correctly. Uh, you can see we've got the article here. Uh, we've got the author, uh, abstract, volume, information. We've got this second one here that I don't know why it didn't come across right. So what we can do is we just move to the trash and get rid of it. So we've got that there. It's got the information. If we go back to the main library, uh, the creator is Mondo. Let's go by. We can see here that we've got it right here as well. So as it, remember, as I said, uh, the main library will contain all your citations that you download. So it's a, a bit of a backup here. But if we go back to Zotero practice too, um, basically you can see that we've got that. So that's one way that you can enter in in citations using Zotero. You can use the, pl the plugin up here at the top. Another way, if you wanted to, is let's just close here. Sometimes you can use ISBNs as well. So if we were to click this here, usually on a catalog, again, it, as I said, it gives you the option to do the click version here. So, or if you wanted to, you can do the ISBN. So we can do ISBN, because I'll show you, it's just to show you a different way of how to do it. So we've copied the ISBN, and up here at the wand, uh, there is basically add items by identifier. So if you were to then copy and paste the ISBN that way. You can see that it's brought across all the information here. Here, remember, as I said, if you need to edit your information, you can edit that way, and that's a book. You could also edit it this way. You could enter it this way. And I'm going to do enter the same resource again to show you <clears throat> some of the things about downloading a resource or entering a resource into your library using the 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 plugin feature on a catalog. So I've re-entered again, and look at what's different here. So we've got basically the title uh, as fire next time forward stroke James Baldwin. We've got James Baldwin author. Um, we also got a difference in dates, which is interesting. Um, but why has that happened? And that has happened because pretty much when we entered the book into the catalog uh, using the software, um, one of the things that happens is we it brings across basically this type of data right here. So we've got James Baldwin author. We've got the fire next time, James James Baldwin. Uh, we've got 1964. Um, so. When you do that, if you're doing that that plugin entering a resource using the plugin feature, you just need to make sure that basically this information comes across. As I said, since it works a bit like a text uh, a word processor, you can always just edit it as well. Um, here, we want to let's edit the name. So one thing here, you can divide it. That way you have last and first name again. So we've got the information we've got in classics, we've got the year and date. And so if you have two, uh, you could basically, let's just say we're going to get rid of this one, um, move items to the trash, press OK. And now we've got two resources here. So that's uh, that's one way, to, uh, another way to enter a resource. If you need to do something completely from scratch, um, Zotero also gives you templates 
to basically fill out. So you've got a book, uh, you interview a journal article. If you were to click here a little bit more, it gives you a wide array of other sources that you can use to a template so you can use to fill in different things. So you've got DCCs right here. You've got maps, ma manuscripts. And the way that th that looks is we just went with a book. It works on this type of function here. So you just copy in the template. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but I think the main thing to keep in mind is that think of it as an investment. So once you get the information in correctly, then you never have to worry about uh, basically um, updating it or whether you've gotten something wrong. So you, what you want to do is you want to get all the information that you need so that you can create a good resource here. And last but not least, um, let's say you have already a couple of PDFs downloaded uh, because you've already been working on on your research um, to go back and then basically work on this. Let's see. I put that PDF. Yes. So I've downloaded a PDF here. You can see it here. I've taken it from Victorian literature and culture. Um, if I were to just close it, so I'm just going to drag it in here. And you can see what it does is Zotero basically um, reads the metadata and it brings it over like that. Again, I can I can see that we're having some difficulties with this here. If I wanted to, basically, I would go back and fix this uh, so that basically it comes across correctly. And once we've got that there, I would, of course, always go back and also take off the caps. But for the sake of time, uh, basically, um, I won't do that right now. So that's one way to to add citations in. Um, so we've created a folder. Uh, so if I wanted to then create, um, actually, let's get rid of this here, a bibliography off of that, again, I could then Press control uh, and then select different resources here. So if you press control and select it, then you're going to right click and then create the bibliography from items. And here you'll have the array of resources here of styles that are here. Um, I want it as a bibliography and I want to save it to my clipboard. I press OK. And then if I If I then open up a Word document here, um, again, I could just paste it here if I wanted to, then it should spit out in basically the type of, of style that I've chose. Remembering, basically, I would want to go back and basically correct the all caps here, but that would be that style. Another thing with Zotero is, uh, if you have downloaded it, and as I said in my email, make sure that you have Word closed, it should come across this Sotero tab here. And this allows you to, to do the, the write and cite feature. So um, for that, you want to make sure that you have Sotero open all the time. So you have it open in the background. And what I want to do is I'll click, want to click right here, add edit citation. The first time you're doing that, it will pop up the same way as you did when you were doing um, a bibliography. You click here, press OK, and this will pop up. And from here, you want to type uh, the resource that you're looking for. So if I'm looking here for Freddy. Press OK. And it will give me the, cent the, the citation there. Again, add a citation. Um, so as I'm working there, if I press bibliography, like that, I can then 
add and edit my bibliography here. So I will click there and it will automatically draw basically the resources that I'm using here into the bibliography so that then if I do. We can add another one here. And let's see. And what it does is it goes adding the sources as I'm using them. So this is that function of writing and citing uh, that we're talking about here. So if I click that and I, let's say I want to edit, maybe it's important. Actually, let's not use that one. Let's say it's important to put a page number. So what I would want to do is click here, click on that, that little bubble there, add the page number, uh, and then press enter and enter and you can add that there. Um, let's say you need to add more authors there uh, in multiple ways. So you can add another author there. Let's see. Um, and you can add it that way and it will order it for you the way you order it for you. Um, so these are some of the features that you could use for writing and citing. And I think it's really, that's helped me the most um, is being able to have it from your Zotero library. And then as you're writing, it's a great way that way you don't leave out references or resources as you're writing. Sometimes if you just are just taking paper notes, it's very easy some, to sometimes uh, use use that uh, to lose those those features there. So, OK. I'm going to stop presenting. Uh, see one hand up, Alex. Um, so if you'd like to, to you, you can go ahead and, and. Yes, uh, Saren, you can change the style after after creating the bibliography. Um, let me just drop in this web uh, page here. This is where you would probably go to find your referencing style for your department. So the way you would do that um, to change the style is, let's see. So we have this document here. Um, you would go to document preferences again, and you could change the style this way. So I'm a bit unfamiliar with any of the other styles um, here as well, so I wouldn't know whether they look right or wrong. Um, but let's go ahead with the MLA because uh, I'm a bit familiar with that. We would press OK. And it would change it to that. You see how the style has changed um, again. So we've lost the year as in a, the American Psychological Association. Um, and that oh, I think has changed the overall bibliography. So if we want to then change it back, basically just go back to it. Press OK and you see how it brings back uh, to the original style. You're welcome. <laughs> um, Alex, I've downloaded Zotero, but my plugin doesn't show on my browser and nothing shows on Word, how do I fix this? OK, so I think um, for the plugin with Zotero, um, there is on that web page. Here, let's see here. So we go to Zotero and download. Um, I'm, just want to check have you gone through this right here zotero connector uh it should adapt to to the browser that you're using so if you're using explorer um it should do that so once you do that you would want to click on that and basically since i have it on um you would connect it there for the plugin it, it zotero can be a little bit temperamental sometimes um so one thing that we have recommended is maybe if you haven't gotten started too much, 
um, you might have to uninstall it and reinstall it, making sure that the word is closed. If not, there might be some other ways to to do it. We'd have to take a deeper look at to see because a word to do the add-ins um, can be some sometimes a bit uh, problematic. But uh, sorry, Alex, I can't. I don't think I can help you with the the word in on that sense. But I know for the plugin, pretty much it's it's through through the tear itself or going through the Chrome store if you if you have it. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? All right, so we reached the end of, of the advertise time of 11.30. Um, I'm going I'm to stay around a little bit longer. So if you'd like to have a bit of practice and I'll be here, um, please feel free. Um, but if not, as I said, um, the most important thing, so I've given you where you can find your, your referencing style, uh, your referencing style. Um, as I said, mo the purpose of these workshops is to introduce you to some of these concepts, give you a bit of practice, and then if you'd like some follow-up, please book an appointment, a uh, one-to-one session with myself or Laura, um, and we'd be more than happy to sit with you a little bit longer and perhaps give a little bit more tailored uh, attention to, to any questions that you might have. Uh, but if not, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, as you said, as I said, if you'd like to stay and practice a little bit, I can stay around for another 15 minutes. Um, or if you have any questions, um, basically, you, I'm happy to answer them here for you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. But again, thank you so much for for coming. And yes, yeah, oh, yes, yes. Uh, so I will send out the slides uh, to you. And then as soon as I get the recording over, I will um, basically, as soon as I have it posted to YouTube, I will send around a link for that as well so you can have a review, right? So let me just stop the recording here that way.